three Nigerians, among other foreigners, who on Tuesday suffered from fresh xenophobic attacks in different locations of Witbank, Mpo Malanga province. The national spokesperson for the Nigerian Union in South Africa, Odafi Ikele, stated that the attacks started in the early hours when community members and taxi drivers went to different areas attacking foreign-owned businesses and foreigners. He stated that no Nigerian lost his or her life, but that they have been injured and they're seeking refuge at Whitbank Police Station. With me in the studio from the last session, Nobel Obasi, legal practitioner, thank you very much for joining us. And we have a new entrant, uh, Daniel Odupe, legal practitioner as well. Pleasure to have you join us. Pleasure to be here. Another attack. We don't, this is not the only one since then, but this is a little bit more pronounced. We had a young Nigerian stabbed to death just um, about or a week or thereabout ago. We are not out of the woods, are we? No, we are not. Um, I was a little bit excited when the president visited um, upon the invitation of President Sui Ram of, of South Africa. But um, I knew all along that that would do very little because everything we try to do now is just will just be an attempt to like palliative measures basically the roots of the issues are not being addressed it's not a nigerian problem it's a south african problem the the, the majority or a good chunk of the populace is living in poverty in the midst of prosperity so um, nigerians and other nationals are soft targets so whether we try to whatever we try to do right now through diplomatic channels we achieve little no effect until the real issues are addressed. It's unfortunate that our brothers and sisters are, you know, at the receiving end of this, this, um, you know, attack and whatever. But it will continue until the government of South Africa wakes up to its responsibility and address the issue of economic marginalisation and um, unemployment and crime rate in the society. The people continue to vent their anger. Okay, so this is coming just over a week after the foreign ministry, Nigerian uh, foreign ministry, said that there is no more violence in South Africa. They also said that there was no need to continue with the evacuation since there was no violence there. Now we have this scenario where some Nigerians and maybe some other foreigners are taking refuge in a, at a police station. And then prior to that announcement by the ministry, we had almost 600 Nigerians who have indicated interest to return uh, from South Africa. What, what are their options now? Um, for the Nigerians, uh, yeah. so the options for Nigerians that are in South Africa, I wouldn't ask them to, you know, to come back to Nigeria because most of them, most of them have built their means of livelihood over the years in South Africa. And closing down that to come back to Nigeria wouldn't really make any sense. So the options for them is for our government to identify with them. Okay, how, how can our government identify with them? Yes, they have been meeting. So last few weeks back, the uh, President uh, Mohamed Buhari met with uh, President Siri Ramaphosa of, of South Africa. And they had uh, lengthy conversations about uh, these lingering xenophobic attacks on Nigeria. But then again, they, like my colleague earlier said, then again, they didn't go into the roots, the roots causes of, you know, this... Then doesn't and that worry you? Because if these people are hoping for a leadership direction, it does look like it's taking some time. Because after that meeting, we, we didn't hear any other thing other than the statement that evacuation has been passed, uh, over 13 uh, bilateral agreement was signed, a visa for businesses and academias to make ease of intercultural and economic uh, integration and all of that. But nothing concrete, it seemed, to address the xenophobic at attack. Are these people hoping in vain? Well, I I wouldn't say they are hoping in vain. You know, I think they they, they, they have um, a high expectation in the government that the government would at some point, you know, reach a reasonable conclusion with uh, the South African government. Although, although, although to some quarters, you know, there is this um, there is this feeling that our government should perhaps perhaps be more stringent with the South African government in dealing with in dealing with this issue of xenophobic. So. Perhaps shutting down some of their, I don't know, maybe shutting down some of their business, or they might not really shut down their business, but they might perhaps, you know, um, uh, in their different bilateral agreements, they could be, they could be, you know, um, 
large uh, stringent conditions, including in those bilateral agreements, which will force South Africans, the South African government, to go back, you know, to the drawing board and see ways whereby they can control their citizens. Because this, it's just because it's Nigeria. It's if 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 the xenophobic attack is being targeted on, say, other foreign, say, Europeans. I don't think we have gotten to this extent. Perhaps they would have taken a drastic action and, and ended it way beyond, way, way, you know, way before what we are seeing right now. So I think it's there for the government to go back and see ways whereby, way, 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 whereby they can, you know, apply stringent measures of this. Because they've, consultations are, are no longer the answers to this, to be yes. honest with you. And not military, uh, not military, uh, not military means uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the thing, the thing about this is, uh, some would argue that agreements and stuff takes a little while to um, come into effect. Uh, but there are those that are saying that it doesn't seem to have had much impact in the. Um, xenophobic attacks in that country, that the bilateral agreement, we heard about it, it was well publicized and all of it, but the end result doesn't seem to be in favor of Nigerians still. Are we being too hasty in jumping to conclusions that that meeting did not provide the results that we want? Yes, I think it might be correct to say that we are a little bit too hasty. We, need not, we should not mix it up. So when you're signing bilateral agreements, even though you're signing, you know, with the other, the other country, you know, you're signing with government officials, you're signing with the educated, the elites, that's who you're signing with, basically, you know. But these attacks are perpetrated by citizens, mostly those, you know, in the lower echelon of the society, you know. So um, they do not even know the content. This is not even their business what the content of the agreement is. So um, to expect that by signing bilateral agreements, you know, it will instantly impact on, you know, the citizens and their behavior towards foreign nationals, you know, might be a little bit hasty. So, so that, that definitely will not bring the results we're hoping it to bring. So should, shouldn't, shouldn't such bilateral agreements, such discussions, such conversation put the common man, the, the people you mentioned that are, you know, spearheading this attack, put them in focus other than talk about people that seem to be at the higher uh, later. Yes, but again, so what we are basically advocating right now is say, sign agreements, sign policies to, and make sure that it affects the people, the members of society. How? Ideally, How? It, should be, it should be possible. But we are talking about people with limited education. So what, sh what kind of proposals, what kind of plans, what kind of moves, in your opinion, will be more effective in getting to these people at the grassroots who seem to be, I mean, more emboldened by the attack than anything else? Indeed, the government of South Africa needs, first and foremost, to demonstrate sufficient political will and seriousness and determination to bring its people to check. It is not by, you know, look, trying to look good because don't forget that by reason of these xenophobic attacks, um, their image in the international community has been, you know, negatively affected. So all, I, in my opinion, I see all the invitation to the president, you know, to come around and all of those things. I see it as, you know, I wouldn't say sure, but, you know, um, diplomatic efforts to make them themselves look good once again in the eye of the international community. But the real issue is for them, like I said, first and foremost, is they are really serious. You, they need to live up to, you know, the expectation, I mean, to their responsibility in terms of, you know, listening to the yearnings of these people because, you know, you can't just expect people to change and, and you're not listening to them. So, number one, they need to listen more to them, you know, find a way to engage them more. And number two, they need to be, to be more firm with their people. It's, it's, I see it as um, um, an issue between a people and its government. You know, it, like I said, it's just unfortunate that our boys and sisters are, are the receiving end. But it's a very, it's a deep systemic issue that, um, challenges that they're going through right now. You know, you, like I said, you, know, you have, I mean, the, the division between the, 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 the rich and the poor is getting wider, especially the whites, you know, the whites, you have the white community, you know, um, controlling as much as 
about 80%, the latest um, one of the Soviets conducted, you know, 80% of the wealth of that nation, the head of the, in the, in the minority. And you have the majority of people languishing in poverty, and they see these foreign nationals coming to their country with skills, you know, they're able to take jobs, you know. If, if, you, if you offer them little amount, they'll collect because they know that if they take it to their country, you know, by the time you convert it, it's something reasonable. They don't mind, but they are lazy, they can't work, and you know, and, and they, see, they see that things are doing well, the economy is not doing too badly, you know, there's this money system, but just not reaching them. So, so it's a deep systemic problem, you know, that, that um, it will take serious, um, you know, political will to correct over. It's a, it's a question of good governance. The government needs to live up to this obsession for you to see a seizure, you know. On but this, in the system. interim, should evacuation be restarted in the interim as, you know, a checkmating measure until long, more long-term solutions can be evolved? I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that evacuation should be, should be continued. Because if you evacuate these people from South Africa to come to Nigeria, do you have any business set up for them to survive? Do you have... Well, most of them, to, to be quite brutal, have lost everything they ever worked for. Some of them have been there okay. for 20 years. And whatever it is their generations have been able to put together has been destroyed in that time. So it's almost like even if they stay back, they still have to start afresh. Yes. So what is wrong in them choosing to come back home? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong in, uh, for them cho choosing to come back home. But, but some of them would... Who feel you know more comfortable being in South Africa than coming more comfortable struggling in South Africa than coming back to Nigeria to come and start afresh because for them they, they they've adapted to you know they've adapted to the to the environment they've adapted you know to the community and they can easily find their way around uh, wherever they are you know their vicinity so for me I don't well I, I think the evacuation so it should it should it should, it should be open for. Uh, Nigerians in South Africa to decide whether they want to come back home or not. So the evacuation shouldn't be compelled, shouldn't be by compulsion. You should just throw it to Nigerians in South Africa and ask them, do you want to come back home? 600 if, says if, they if, want if, to come back home. Yeah, if well, I may add to that, be, okay. if I may add to that, I think it was, in my opinion, I think it was a huge mistake. I mean, to, <laughs> it's illusionary to think that things were just, I'm surprised that, I mean, that, you know, the, the, the evacuation effort was, Stopped. I mean, I think it was a grave mistake. Allow, like you, like Riley pointed out, there's no place like home. That's the truth. You know, you want to, you don't want to work hard for decades, and then you wake up one morning, and then somebody has destroyed it. I'm not saying that Nigeria is perfectly safe, but there is a greater sense of belonging in your country. You have a stronger moral basis. Maybe in other um, civilized climes, maybe you can trust the system. You know, and the judiciary to protect you and what have you. Unfortunately, South Africa is not there yet. Nigeria, with all our challenges and with all our troubles, you know, I do not see how you know you just wake up somebody uh, one morning and then a group of people just come and then I I don't, I don't see how, I believe that if you want to build something la long lasting, you know, it, it make more sense to say let me come to my home. Let me you know, because if there if there are challenges, you have a moral basis to stand up. You have people who you have a greater sense of belonging, people who support you. Nobody can just marginalize you in your own country. It's not just like I think it was a, it was a, it gave a to have stopped the evacuation. So beyond the bilateral the leadership issue between the two countries trying to use that as a I mean come together and find a consensus solution to some of these xenophobic attacks. What can the Nigerian government do to make the home base a bit more attractive so people can, you know, earn good living in their own country? Well, so, first of all, it's to, to um, bring up policies that would um, uh, make the economy better. Because most of these people that travel outside the country, they, 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 most of them if not all of them, all of them go there for economic reasons. So they are going there to, you know, uh, get better, uh, uh, be better services. They are going there to, to have better uh, approach to life. They are going there to, you know, um, have good basic needs. So they feel Nigeria is, a, is, is an economy which is really not meant for, for them, you know. Uh, they, they, they feel traveling abroad will afford them more opportunities to get better, you know, to, you know, to work harder and get value for what they work for than Nigeria. So I believe 
back home, if Nigerian government, if, if, if there's a very good uh, enabled uh, economy for Nigerians, I think Nigerians, most Nigerians wouldn't even bother to travel. Because Nigeria is, is a very beautiful country. The, the weather is, is, is okay. It's, it's, it's claiming to everybody. The people around are not as hostile as others. So to flip this conversation on its head, in other countries, we know of, um, I think, Malaysia that have written to Nigeria telling them to tell their people that there are no jobs there waiting for them to come and take. And even in this same South Africa, we have unemployment. We still have infrastructure deficit. We still have in insecurity to a certain degree. So what really should keep them from coming home? <laughs> because if the, because that's some of the things that have been cited. When you ask some of them living in South Africa, they will say, oh, no, I can't come back. There's insecurity. They will kill me. Uh, I can't come back. There is unemployment. I will not be able to survive and all of that. But this same thing exists in that area that they've chosen to go, this time South Africa. Felicity, let's be honest. Take away xenophobic attack from South Africa. South Africa, as it is today, is 10 times better than Nigeria. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's, let's, that's let's, practically let's, a slap on her. That's the truth. Oh, that's where we are. Oh, that's where we oh, are. That's, that's, that's where we are. But we're supposed to be the that's giant of Africa. Do you, do you know how much power you need? Do you know how much power South Africa generates? We are, over, we are about 200 million. We, we, we generate about uh, 6,000 megawatts. South Africa, that is far, far less. Do you know how much they generate? There's, there's a gulf in, in class between where we are right now. Things are getting better, hopefully. We're making we're slow and steady, we're making progress. But take away the attack. If you ask an every Nigerian and say, look, your security will be guaranteed, would you choose between South Africa and Nigeria? Everybody will choose South Africa. The th things, have you been to Cape Town and some of those places? I mean, things, those places, all you need is to have skill sets, is to be empowered, is to, is to be able to do something. The system, we, and that's why Nigerians and um, citizens of other African countries are able to earn a living there. Things are, I've been proving I should be there before, things are a lot better than what we have here in Nigeria. Okay, so it's a challenge for us as a people. You asked the question earlier, what should we do to keep our people? Good governance, the thing we've been crying for, do the right things. I was really excited when um, um, I think I heard, I read um, that the uh, Mrs. Abikadakui, I can't remember her push portfolio yeah, now. Yeah, the Spire she, Chairman of the Yes, yes, she, she, she entered an agreement with the Bank of Industry to provide so loans for the returnees. Fantastic, fantastic, uh, you know, you know, you know um, policy or whatever you, you know, fantastic, you know, things like that. Deliberately empower your people. Let us, why have we not fixed power problem in this country? If you fix power alone, if you fix power alone, the kind of solution, I mean, the kind of Empowerments that we and jobs creation and, and what have you that will that will be an offshoot of that will make many Nigerians. So the issue is that we are still we are still far far behind. There's still a long way to quality go leadership. Of, absolutely, key. absolutely. Thank you very much as always for sharing your thoughts with us. All right, we'll go on a short break now for a plus package, and when we return, I'll be giving my take. Don't go away. The Senate Committee on the Niger Delta has criticized the budget of the ministry, saying it will not create any impact in the region. Lawmakers at a budget defense session with the minister, Senator Gosu Akpabiu, have asked the ministry to reappraise the budget and make project and capital expenditures more realistic and achievable. We need to look at this budget again. Again, with you, and uh, we expect you to do your because the documents we did were not supplied to us. So we will, uh, we will continue with the defense. Let me finish. They have asked me to do it. We will continue with the defense on Monday. I think they should reject this budget and do something going to the defense history. The budget stack that you have now is not different from the one you did last year, two years ago, three years ago. And that's been the problem. This type of budget doesn't produce anything physical. But I wish this sort of letter that I would look at the problem of the people of the Niger Delta area. And take some key little projects, concentrate on it, and do it well for people. So it don't start sound like any of this. The of the worst establishment and say it's ending this. And it allows room 
for funny activities because of the way it's set up. This project looks like any basic project. So you the best who want to take them with your Why don't you take the major roads or major or red or something and begin to fund it and give like that that something for you to do that I don't think I can take jobs. But if you have left what you are doing to go to university to do their home. The same university and this certification and the best is the home. Uh, the, 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 the senators feel that uh, there ought to be completion of major projects that are already in the Niger Delta. I agree with them, but unfortunately uh, we are working under a very tight uh, envelope. And uh, the ministry was allocated a sum of about 23 billion, and that's some 60% of it will go to already existing projects in the region, and so 40% will go to probably new projects in the region, new demands. So if you look at it very well, it's not possible for you to capture all projects with that, that, at that amount, and it's not going to be possible to even complete even 10 kilometers of uh, road in the region. So I think instead of saying that the budget was rejected, I think that the distinguished senators should collectively make an appeal to the Minister of uh, Finance, Budget and National Planning uh, to improve upon uh, the envelope and to expand it a little so it can capture and uh, at least substantially most of the yearnings and aspirations of the good people of the Niger Delta and not taking cognizance of already outstanding uh, uh, projects that were conceptualized uh, since 2016, 2015, 2017, 2018, which are yet to be paid for. And uh, again, uh, there is nothing we could have done about the budget based on the fact that we are yet to receive even one naira for the capital uh, uh, project for 2019. To be honest, the xenophobic conversation is exhausting but only because the solutions are plentiful. What is lacking is the will to make moves that will translate to a reduction in the spate of the attacks. Reports abound of Nigerians living in South Africa saying they will not return home in spite of the attacks. Not because they are immune or safe, but because they would rather South Africa than return to what they describe as suffering in Nigeria. They cite unemployment, poor infrastructure, insecurity and epileptic power supply, among other issues. It is their choice, no doubt, but I worry that if they are hoping for leadership to help reduce their suffering, it might take a while. If the meeting between the Nigerian and South African presidents had any benefits, for me, it is yet to manifest. Maybe I'm being too anxious, but that is the truth. We're yet to see something tangible. What the Nigerian government can do in the interim is to expand genuine efforts to make it easier for Nigerians to make a good living in their own country. That is my submission. For sharing your time with us tonight, I thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.